Hi, buddy. Welcome. I'm the Strategy Professor, and today we're going to be talking about laning fundamentals for League of Legends. So we're going to go in-depth about how you can win a lane and just understand it. And there's going to be some advanced things in here, but I have in mind people that haven't been playing the game that long or people that are in silver and bronze, just to give you the basic of what is laning, what is resource management, how do you trade correctly, what does trading mean, um, and all of those good things. So it's going to have some advanced stuff in here if you're familiar a lot with the game, but I'm also going to slow down and explain kind of just the basic principles at work here so that people can understand how to actually win a lane and what goes into that. Okay, so special thanks to Steve for this uh, funding this guide. I really appreciate it. I'm going to bring a couple other guides by Steve as well. He donated quite a bit um, to really help out, especially uh, newer players that you know, want to learn kind of the basics, fundamentals of the game. So this is going to be part of a fundamentals series. I think I'm also going to do the uh, fundamentals of rotation and just sort of the fundamentals of the support role and sort of what you should be trying to do as support and why different styles of support work with different team comps and things like that. So I have a few different guides that are going to be coming up over the next week or so from Steve and some other people as well. Um, but we're going to start off talking about sort of what is laning, how does that work, and then I'm going to focus mostly on resource management. There are five things that I want to focus on. That's items, cooldowns, positioning, uh, vision, and communication. Okay, so if you don't have time to watch the whole video, you can always find timestamps in the description. You'll also find access to this Google Doc if you just want to skip down and look it over as well. I'm going to try to move through this as fast as I can, but I also want to be detailed um, and make sure that I'm giving you good, thorough content and not just, you know, a, a five-minute, super broad video that doesn't help anybody. Okay, so it's going to be thorough, but I'm going to try to move through it as much as I can. Okay, so what is laning? The laning phase refers to uh, the part of the game where all of the towers are up and people are primarily going to be confined to their lanes. They're going to be sitting there. They're going to be farming. Um... And there's not going to be very many team fights usually, and there's not going to be a ton of roaming. Although it depends on the champions, it depends on what's going on in the game, there might be some roaming while the towers are still up. But by and large, in most games, people are just going to stay in their lanes, with the exception of the jungler, until at least one of the first towers fall. So that's what I'm talking about. By tier 1 towers. We'll have another video, like I said, that's probably going to be about like roaming, team fighting, um sort of uh pri I, I do have a video that's like that right now which we'll talk about later which is uh five tips for better macro but i'll make another one kind of in this fundamental style eventually uh, but i would say that by and large roaming you don't want to do it especially if you're silver and bronze um before the lanes fall it's just it's going to put you too far behind i know that some guides out there will tell you well the support needs to roam all the time and that's how you win that's not true, especially in Silver and Bronze, because if you leave the lane too much, if you leave at the wrong time, your AD carry is going to miss CS, and that's the best case scenario. The worst case, which happens a lot, is your AD carry is not going to back up, they're going to get caught, they're going to get killed, and they're going to flame you. So, anyways, small aside, most of the time during laning phase, you want to stay in the lane. That's the moral of the story, unless you're warding really quickly, or unless there are very specific windows where you can roam, like after you buy your first item... If you're like an hour star or something, you get mobility boots, you want to poke your head middle and try to, you know, make a play uh, while you're warding up the river, that's fine. But in general, you want to try to stay in your lane. So most players stay in their lane, and the laning phase ends when the first tower breaks. After the first tower breaks, people will start rotating around the map, trying to take different objectives. Um, and so the game changes up a little bit there. We're not going to cover that in this video. We're going to stick with laning, though. But that's usually when laning ends is when the first tower breaks. Especially if it's bot tower. Because that opens up Dragon, and then people will rotate to middle and all of that stuff. If the top tower breaks, people might still stay up there for a while, depending on what's going on. Sometimes top laners just don't roam around that much. But if the bottom tower breaks, it, the laning phase is over. People are going to start rotating. Okay, so let's think about uh, resource management here. So the way that you win League of Legends is you manage your resources better than the enemy manages their resources. Okay, so what does that mean? Is that gold or what? It is gold, sort of, but it's a lot of things that people don't think of as well. Your resource is basically anything you can do to have an influence on the outside, on the um, outcome of the game. That's a resource, okay? So that can be gold. That can be your cooldowns, like your ultimate or your shield or um, your items. It could be your redemption. It could be your locket. 
Those are all resources that you have to influence the outcome of the game. Your positioning, where you are on the map, um, what you're doing, that matters a lot. You know, if you're in the wrong place at the wrong time, that can be a very big deal. Like, you could lose the game for that. If you're in the right place at the right time and the enemy's in the wrong place, then that could also influence the game. And you might win just because you're there before the other enemy support is there. Or you're there just in time to save your ally when they get caught out doing something stupid. So, your positioning is a very important resource as well. Where you're choosing to move and how you're positioning um, in team fights and in the landing phase and so on and so forth. Vision. Another great resource, especially is support. You know, where are you going to place your wards? How often are you going to buy control wards? Where are you going to place those control wards? Do you have other things that can give you vision? Are you using that? Such as uh, Zyra plants are a great resource. Um, are you using other things to check bushes? Are you like throwing Nami bubbles in bushes to try to gain vision? Um, to see if anyone's there before you ward? All of these things are vision management tools that you really need to be using. Are you using the um, the dust plants well enough to clear out vision? Are you using your sweeper well enough? Um, all of that would fall under the umbrella of vision, and that's a very important resource. Uh, communication, finally, is a major resource that very few people use correctly. You need to be shot calling. You need to be pinging. You need to be using your knowledge, your resource, to help influence the game because if you're just sitting there if you know something if you know how your team could improve their play if you know that they should be rotating over to dragon instead of just goofing around at baron or if you know that they should be taking a tower after you get a kill instead of backing you need to let them know you need to ping that say hey go get this tower we just got two kills bottom why are you backing you know you don't have to ping you don't have to type that out but just ping the tower like three or four times and say hey come get this tower and then people say, oh, okay. Because most people are on autopilot when they play League. Especially in Silver and Bronze. Um, and just newer players in general are going to be on autopilot a lot of times. I mean, mo frankly, most experienced players are also on autopilot. Um, but that means they're just doing their thing and they're not focusing on the greater strategy. They're just going to be like, oh, there's a person, kill them. Oh, I just killed somebody. I've got some gold. I'm going to back. Like, they're not thinking about well, how should I position this wave? Could we contest the tower right now? If I back right now, is the enemy going to be able to push in and kill our tower? Um, you know, should I ward Baron or Dragon on the way out? Like, these are questions that people just don't consider. They just, you know, they're just on autopilot. They've got this song going on in the background, or they're texting their friend, or they're talking to their roommate, or, you know, they're thinking about this quiz they have tomorrow. Um, they're thinking about this girl and whether or not she's going to call them back. You know, they've got all sorts of things on their mind, but usually only half of their mind is on League. So you want to tune them in and make sure that they know what should be going on. So communication is a huge, huge resource in League of Legends. So we'll talk about that a little bit as well. Okay, let's go ahead and jump in. Start talking about items here. Okay, so items are the most conspicuous resource. This is the very obvious resource that people have, right? And it's really important to understand that gold doesn't mean anything by itself, okay? So if you're sitting on a stack of 3,000 gold, it doesn't matter. You might as well have zero gold. Until you put that gold into items, it does not matter. Okay, no one, I don't think, it, I'm trying to think, there's a lot of champions in League of Legends. I'm pretty sure nobody scales off of raw gold in your inventory. Um, so you need to spend that on items. And so it's very important to understand that when you have a lot of gold in your inventory, you need to find a time to go back and get those items. And the, it's like back timing is really, really important. That's going to be too advanced for this guide. But just understanding when you need to back to get core items. A very easy example would be like 80 carry. If you get 1300 gold for your BF sword, you need to back to get your BF sword. Or if you're someone like Ezreal, you need to back at 750 to get your tier of the goddess. Right? Um, after you get a kill, usually in a lane, you need to back and get something. As a support, usually... You know, you'll want to get your tier 2 gold item and boots. Or if you don't have enough for boots, like your tier 2 gold item and like a fairy charm. Or, you know, a control ward and a couple of pots. Whatever it is, you need to back. You need to spend your gold efficiently. Okay? And it's important to research and learn the best items for your champion. You know, I talk about it some. But some a really good resource that I use, which is not always right, but it's often pretty accurate. If you just go to Pro Builds, great website. This is a good place to start thinking about champions. You can just click on this. Let's say that you're playing Janna, something like that. Click on Janna. It'll tell you what all of these 
either pro or challenger level players from all kinds of different regions, what they are getting. Um, and you can see very specific matchups here, and that's why I like pro builds as well. It's like, okay, well, um, you know, Ambition's playing Janna, and he's against Tom Kench here. So how did, how did this game unfold? So you can actually look at sort of the context, which is why I prefer this to looking... You can look at things like op.gg, and I'll go ahead and show you that as well. So if we go to, you know, op.gg, leaderboards... Uh, actually, champions. Um, let me just pull up Janet here. Like, you'll get aggregate data, right? It'll say, like, such and such percentage of people buy this item, such and such percentage of people buy this other item. Uh, you know, and they have this and this win percentages. But you got to keep in mind, and a lot of people don't realize this, but, like, this statistic is from Platinum Plus korean players okay and it tells you that on version you know 8.4 and so you don't know other regions and this is really just like fairly high elo stuff which could differ from other stuff now this is still high elo stuff here as well but you have context you know what the matchup is you know that this person was against tom kench when they built this you can see the order that they built their items you can see the order that they skilled stuff up and you can see their individual runes. So this is just much more tailored to understand context. Because here, you don't understand the context. You don't know, okay, well, why does why do people sometimes build Ardent Sensor first? Or why do they build Redemption, you know, first? Like, what determines if they're going to get Redemption or Locket? You don't really know, right? It just gives you statistics here, but you don't know any context. So... You know, you can look at some of these uh, top level players too on the right, like the one tricks, and this is usually like Diamond Three Plus is people they'll put up here. Um, and you can see the region and stuff, and so you can kind of see like how the game unfolded here as well, which is interesting. But just find a website. It doesn't it doesn't matter a ton which website it is, but I like like I said, I like pro builds because you get the context, you get to understand, look at the matchups. You get to see the order that the person built the stuff. You get to know who it is. So, you know, I might know, okay, well, Ambition is not a support player. So he's basically auto-filled. But what would someone who, you know, is a support player, what would Mad Life get, for example? Right? Or what would Stunt get? Who's one of the top, um, you know, challenger support players? What would Stunt get? <clears throat> if we look down here. This matchup. Now, he had a bad game here. He was 2-8. and eight. But what does he get? So I think it's important just to look over this stuff, find the items, and just get a basic grasp of like which items are really strong on your champion. And then start to learn, start to pay attention. Okay, when should I get certain items versus other items? I do have individual champion guides where I explain these things for a lot of supports. Like I do have one for Janna. Um, and I'm going to be adding more for different supports you know, all the time. But if I don't have an in-depth guide for a champion, at least, you know, go to and look at something like Pro Builds. There will be other guides on YouTube as well. So I'm going to try to add in more champion guides for you on the channel that you can look at. And if you want to know, well, do I have a champion guide for it? I have a playlist of uh, specific support champion guides. Like I said, I'm always adding more of these things, so I'm going to be adding more soon. But, uh, yeah, you can kind of see here the champions that I have guides for. Now, some of these are a bit older. You know, some of these are from, like, last season. But, like, the style of items is probably going to be similar. Obviously, some have been nerfed, some have been buffed. But the type of items that are on those champions are still going to be pretty relevant, even if it's kind of an older guide. Okay, but research, try to understand itemization, try to understand champions. I just came up with two new guides for 8.4. Uh, one is on AP itemization, so that'll let you know all of the new AP stuff that's going on. And one is enchanter itemization, so I tell you when you should get redemption, when you should get ardent sensor, when you should get locket, you know, all of that good stuff. So be sure to check out those guides if you want to know more details about specific items um, and whether those might be useful on a champion that you enjoy playing. Okay, and then just think carefully about when you're buying this item. How does this item actually help you win the game? So if you're buying Redemption, you're basically saying, okay, I want to be teamfight dominant, and I think I can be safe enough where I'm not going to get killed because 
it doesn't have much defense on it. You know, it only has the health. So if you're on a champion that you think you can position fairly safely with and you want to have a team fight dominant item and you feel confident that you're going to be able to use that item appropriately, remember that Redemption is a skill shot and it is easy to mess up, right? It's got a two and a half second delay. If you're too late on it, um, then it's not going to work properly. And it does have a lot of reach. It has 5,500 range. So you can use it halfway across the map. So Redemption's a very good enchanter item, but you have to be able to use it correctly. So um, you would get that for team fights. Is it optimal in the given game state? So maybe you already have Redemption, and now you're trying to decide, well, should I get Locket, or should I get um, Ardent Sensor, Banner of Command? Um, just think, okay, well, maybe since they have a really fed... I don't know, Zed or something like that. Like maybe there's Zed's 3-0 and o after you finish Redemption. Um, you might say, okay, I need some protection now. Like, I would love to get Ardent Sensor, but Zed's just going to kill me if I don't get some protection. And so you might have to get a Locket just so that you get that shield. So you get a little bit of armor from Locket, and then you get that activatable shield to help you out against Zed. Or you might say, you know what? On Janna, I usually like to get Mobility Boots or Ionian Boots. But because the Zed is so fed, maybe I need to get Ninja Tab Eye instead to help protect myself so I don't die. Right? Or maybe you're playing Zyra and they have, uh, I don't know, a really fed Talon or something like that. You just might have to get something like a Zanya's Hourglass or at least an Arm Guard, even though that item is pretty terrible on Zyra. Sometimes you just need to not die. Or maybe you have to get a Banshee's Veil because... Um, you know, they just have this Lissandra that just keeps all winning and trying to kill you, right? Who's just going really hard, like, trying to CC and kill you every every time. So you just have to kind of think about what's going on and be willing to adjust your build to kind of see, you know, what the deal is. Okay. Um, so you need to tab often and examine enemy and ally items. So don't forget you can press tab and you can see all the items that you have and the enemies who have been spotted on the map have so just think about who's strong how can you play around your strength to win how can you avoid the enemy strength to lose so a good example of this might be um you know something like a recon for example you're playing recon and you know your 80 carry is 0 and 5 right but your mid lane katarina is 5 and 0 so, you know, going into the game, you may have thought, okay, I'm playing Rakan, I'm with Zaya. I initially wanted to get um, Ardent Sensor really quickly so that, you know, Zaya would... It's really good on Zaya, right? So she does more damage, she attacks faster, all that good stuff. But she's doing so poorly that I feel like I need to get Redemption now because Katarina's really strong and I would just want to heal her and keep her up in a team fight. Ardent Sensor's not going to do much for her because she doesn't auto-attack very often. So I need to adjust my build and get redemption instead. Just what I talked about, right? So it's not just like... You need to be watching everything. So you need to be tabbing, looking at items, and then actively making your item choices to help your team win. So whoever's really strong, whether it's that 5-0 and Katarina, maybe it's the Kane who is, uh, you know, 4-0... and Maybe nobody's doing well. Maybe everybody's getting destroyed and you just need to get a banner of command or something just to put in a side lane just to try to stall out the game, right? Um, or maybe, like, you need to be the frontline initiation, but they have really fed assassins and you're just afraid you're going to die, so maybe you have to get more defensive items than you like on Rakan. Maybe you have to do something like Ninja Tabai, Frozen Heart or something. That'd be extremely rare, but maybe... <laughs> Maybe that's what you got to do. Maybe they have a 5 AD team and they're all fed. You just got to think carefully about the choices that you're making and just try to think, okay, this is going to help me win because it's going to help this character. Or this is going to help me win because it's going to help counter, you know, whoever the enemy has that's strong. So look at your items and just think carefully. And make your plays around who has strong items around different power spikes so we're not going to talk about specific power spikes too much but like a common one would be you know once varus completes his ginsu's rage blade he is extremely strong on one item and the same is true of kogmaw so if you know that if your kogmaw just completed a ginsu's rage blade fight you know like if you have rage blade and the enemy 80 carry 
only has like a BF sword and berserker boots or something, uh, you know, you should go at them. You should try to fight them. Conversely, if the enemy Varus has a Gensu's Rage Blade and the Zaya on your team only has, uh, you know, pieces of an Essence Reaver, but she hasn't completed it yet, uh, you should not fight because they're probably going to kill you because they have a really strong item. Right, and so you need to, or if you're playing Zyra, you know, you can think, okay, I just completed my Sorcerer Boots, I just completed my Haunting Guys, I'm ready to murder some people, let's go fight at a dragon. Or I'm just going to do the best that I can to just start a fight. Because I know I've got these two items and I'm going to be really strong. So just think carefully about the items that you have, the items that your allies have, and the items that enemies have, and just think, is this a good time to fight? Now it's going to take some practice to figure out, you know, which items are going to be strongest on which champions. Um, you know, and that's beyond the scope of this video to cover that for every single interaction. You know, watch guides that I have on my channel or watch other guides on YouTube. Uh, but it's important to start thinking about that, to, to make that part of your decision-making process. To think before you fight and just think, is this a good fight? Can we win this fight based on the items, based on, you know, the level of the champion? You know, if they're much more than one level higher than you, they're going to have a massive, massive advantage in terms of stats. So it's important to, um, you know, think about these things. So think before you fight. Okay, another thing kind of related to that are cooldowns. So items, really important resource. Cooldowns, also really important resource that a lot of people don't pay attention to. You need to pay attention to enemy cooldowns and think about fighting them when they don't have their cooldowns. Okay, and waiting until you have your cooldowns to fight them. So if the enemy team uses a flash, you need to ping that, right? So you press tab, and you can press control and just left click on their summoner. So left click on their flash, and it'll put it in the chat so that people know they use flash. And if they have timestamps enabled, they can see the time they use the flash. So flash is about five minutes in length, and then ignite and exhaust. I don't remember the exact timers, but they're about three minutes or so. Um... And it depends if they have, you know, Summoner Spellbook or, you know, Cosmic Insight or something else that could lower their um, Summoner cooldowns. Um, you know, that, that could vary a little bit. But in general, that's just a good rule of thumb is Flash 5 minutes. Other ones are like 3 minutes. Flash and Teleporter 5, everything else is about 3. <clears throat> um, so abuse those moments of power. Call down the jungler. Say, hey, that Varus just flashed. Free kills bottom. You know, the jungler may come down, they may not, but at least you're letting them know. Um, Blitzcrank misses a hook. Don't just sit there and watch him for the next 20 seconds, you know? Um, go get him. Like, if you're Zyra and Blitzcrank misses that hook, run up, start auto-attacking him, start casting plants. You know, if you're Sona or Nami, just run up and just start fighting him. Because he's not going to have it for 20 seconds. The same is true of, like, a thrash hook. So just, like, go and look at popular supports and just think about, like... Just have a general idea of what their cooldowns are. You don't have to have like the exact precise timing in their head. They're like, okay, they have 20% cooldown. It's usually a 13 second cooldown. So now it's, you know, whatever the number is, right? Now it's 11.2 uh, seconds. You know, you don't have to have a stopwatch with you, but just like have a general idea about when you can fight them. So for example, early on, Janna uses that shield. If she only has one point in shield, it's going to be like a 20 second cooldown. And a lot of Janas are going towards maxing W in lane, which makes them extremely vulnerable because they're going to have a really weak shield that's on a very long cooldown. So if you see that Janna's shield, if you go up to auto attack as Nami or something like that, and Janna shields that auto attack, then you know for the next 20 seconds you can do whatever you want to them because they're going to have no shield. Or if um, Varus misses his ultimate. Let's say he tries to ult you and he misses go at him a lot of the time like go fight him because he's not going to have that anymore um so you know just pay attention to what the cooldowns are and just have a general idea about how long that lasts and if they are missing things that's really powerful right like they're not going to win if blitzcrank misses a hook and you go fight him you know e sometimes even if you're behind in items they're not going to be able to deal with you um, if they're missing cool, uh, key cooldowns. So just make sure you're watching that. Just think, okay, they missed something. I'm going to go make them pay. I'm going to punish them for doing that. Okay? 
Um, and try not to fight if your team is missing like key cooldowns. So if you see your Varus miss an ultimate on somebody, ping back and get people out of there. Like, do not fight. Or um, trying to think of like another high impact ult. Maybe Gangplank uses his ult to farm a wave top lane just randomly. And your team is sitting there about to fight. Like ping him back. Say do not fight. We don't have Gangplank's ultimate. We need that if you need that to fight. Maybe Fizz misses his fish. Maybe Galio like wastes his ultimate. Whatever it is, if your team doesn't have it, and it's a really important ult. Ash misses her arrow. Um, then wait. Just tell your team, don't fight, wait. So many people will say, oh, you know, I'm Ash, I missed the ult, whatever, I'm going to go fight anyways. No, that's a really important part of your kit. So you need to wait on it. Okay? So if it's your cooldown, ping it. You know, if you're Zyra and you just use your ultimate to pick off their support... Um, and your team is trying to team fight after that, and you're just like, well, we're still pretty far behind. I don't know if we can win. Ping your ultimate cooldown and just let them know, hey, hey, don't fight. I still have 30 seconds on my ult. Okay? Um, if bot lane, if your uh, AD carry wants to fight and your ignite has 10 seconds on cooldown, just say, wait, wait, wait 10 seconds. I have ignite. Because that could be the difference between you getting the kill or not. So just ping your ignite cooldown. You know, just hold down control and just click on your ignite. To let them know that, you know, if you just wait 10 more seconds, there's a much higher probability that you're going to be able to get that kill off of your Ignite. Or if you're like Alistar and your Flash is up in 5 seconds, just let people know. Um, if your ally or the enemy, if you see them teleport, ping it. Like if your team is about to get into a fight bot lane and you look at your ally and their teleport's not going to be up for 15 seconds, just ping that teleport timer say, wait wait 15 seconds until the top lane can teleport down here so similar to items just pause and think a little bit before you fight just press tab look at it assess the situation and then carry on you have a little if you look in the bottom right now where the portraits are like just above the map um you'll have a little green dot if their ultimate is up and now it has a little uh timer on it so you can see how long it's going to be so you can you know it doesn't tell you the exact time, but you can see okay, Varus has like a quarter of his bar left, so he's probably got fifteen or twenty seconds left before his ult's up. Um. So just keep that in mind. Just look down there and see if you see those green dots. Look at your mini map. See if everybody's there to fight. Don't fight a four v five. You know, press tab. Look at the cooldowns, especially teleport. Okay, the most important things to look at when you're looking at tab are teleport and smite. Okay. So if your top laner doesn't have teleport and theirs does or, you know, if they're just not running teleport, if they're running at night and they're just randomly top lane, don't fight. Okay? Um, or if you are about to try to go do Baron or Dragon and your jungler just used their, like, Frozen Smite to kill steal something in a small skirmish that you had and now they don't have smite you need to ping that you need to say hey we don't have smite don't do baron you know they have a lux she could steal it with her laser um so just ping that you know is it your job to ping the jungler's smite shouldn't they be paying attention and should they like not ping back if they don't have smite yes they should be doing all of this but you have to be the person to do it yes the top lane should ping their teleport yes the jungler should ping their smite but they're just on autopilot like I explained earlier, they're on autopilot. They're not paying attention. So you have to be the one paying attention who calls these things out. Now, you don't have to do all of this, of course. I know this is a lot of stuff. But the more of this you can do and the more you can get used to doing this, then the more you will climb. Okay? And this is all just strictly game knowledge stuff. This is no mechanics. Like, you don't have to hit any skill shots. You can play the easiest champion in the game mechanically. And if you do this stuff, you will climb up. This is strictly about game knowledge and just getting your team to make smart decisions. Um, okay, let's talk about positioning here really quickly. So that's pretty much, so just abuse cooldowns. If the enemy doesn't have them, fight them. If your team doesn't have them, don't fight. Okay, positioning. So you need to understand matchups and play the matchup well. I do have a video which has portions of it about matchups. So, you know, I've got that linked here if you want to go check it out. 
I'll tell you really quickly, and these are just very general rules of thumb. I don't cover all champions here. This is not meant to be exhaustive. This is just meant to be examples of different types of champions and how they function in in sort of the abstract in a lane. So just keep this in mind. But, you know, just start to think to yourself, okay, how is this lane going to unfold? Can we actually fight these people or not early on? Or are we a scaling comp who's going to get stronger as the game goes on? Right? So you need to think carefully about this. So strong lane poke support. So these champions are very good. If the enemy team can't engage on them, can't fight them, then they're going to be very good at sort of whittling down the enemy over time. So like Sona, Nami, Soraka, Lulu, Karma. These are usually great into tanks that don't have engage or um, other weak lane champions. All right, but they can be very, uh, they can have some major problems against all in champions. So they may not be that great against things like Leona, Zyra, um, stuff like that. These strong all in supports, Brand, Blitzcrank, Thrash, Alistar, they might have problems against those. Okay, but they're going to be good against these weak lane, you know, supports typically like Taric, Tom, so on and so forth. In general, once again, it depends on who they're paired with. So sometimes you might have someone who's a strong lane poke champion, like maybe you have a Sona, but maybe it's paired with an Azrael. And then maybe they have something that's like a strong lane AD carry, like Draven, and, um, you know, it's paired with, you know, like a weak lane support, like a Taric. You might still lose that lane. Because the Draven's going to override the Ezreal so much that it's not going to matter that you're playing Sona. Maybe. So, you know, there's no, like, really easy equation for these things. But this is just stuff in general to keep in mind when you're starting to assess a lane, right? So, strong lane, all-in champions. These champions have a lot of threat early game. Um, you really need to be very careful if these champions are in your lane because they could kill you pretty easily. So, Zyra, Brand, Leona, Blitzcrank, Thresh, Alistar, Bard... These champions can punish you really hard if you're out of position. And so you might need to back up and play a little bit more chill uh, against these champions, potentially, unless you are also on one of those champions and you're prepared to fight to the death. Um, it's going to be tough. Okay, so these are weak lane supports. These supports typically will have a really hard time exerting pressure on a lane. Not always. Once again, yeah, you can kill people in lane with Tom Kench if you eat them. Yeah, Braum, if you like flash on him in Q and get your stun, you can dominate. Same thing with Taric if you flash stun or you land a lot of Morgue Binds. Or if Rakan is paired with Zaya and, you know, you cheese the enemy team at level 1, you both go W. Like, yes, they can be strong. But in general, in many matchups, these champions are going to get pushed in and they're not going to be that strong most of the time without jungler help in 2v2s against these types of champions. So these types of champions usually bully out these champions early, champions from this in this list. <clears throat> but these champions can be very good. I mean, Janna, as we saw on the OP.GG here, at least, you know, in the Korea, and I would imagine that even in America, she's almost always one of the top uh, supports. Yeah, she's number two right now. She's almost always a top five support, even though, you know, she's a weak lane champion because she scales so hard later on in the game. So Janna definitely can win at all Lelos. But you'll notice that a lot of these champions up here are strong lane champions. Okay, so Scion, I didn't mention him here, but, you know, he's a really strong bully early game champion. Um, Nami... You know, Strong Champ, Soraka, Lulu, Sona. These all have great sort of harassment, poke champions. Um, these four. And then Blitzcrank is kind of the all-in burst champion. So all of these are pretty strong lane champions until you get down to Taric. And then Janna's kind of the outlier there because she scales so hard. Um, <clears throat> and then strong lane 80 carries. You've got Draven, Misfortune, Jin, Varus, and Caitlyn. So these have really good trading power early. You could potentially put... Tristana is kind of a weird one. Like, if you get an advantage, if you get ahead, she can be very strong and oppressive because she can just W and jump right on you. But in general, she she has pretty good burst early, but she's very short range early on. Um, so Tristana is a weird one. But in general, these other ones, like they have really good range or they have really good ability damage 
champions and they get like they have a really fast power spike once they get the Sarah and Dirk. So the lethality users like Misfortune and Jen in particular are very strong early on. And so pairing them with someone else who's strong, like a Zyra, a Brand, or a Leona, means that you can severely punish your lane. It's going to be a hard win lane, um, and you're definitely going to win. Now, you might get outscaled later into the game, but you're definitely going to crush your lane unless the jungler comes down and camps you or something like that. So strong lanes, you know, don't always win games, but oftentimes if you are applying good macro knowledge if you're rotating correctly and getting objectives and pressing your advantage then strong lanes can definitely be the starting point to winning a game okay uh, and then weak lanes 80 carries would be things like vein ezreal twitch and then to a lesser so those three are definitely weak early on like they're almost always going to lose lane unless it, it's just something crazy's going on. And then, like, Jinx, Tristana, Zaya, and Cog are typically not going to be the strongest. They usually require a couple of items before they start taking off. But they can certainly, you know, do a little bit of damage in the right circumstances. Okay, so wh why is that important? Well, you need to understand how you want to position the lane. Because you have an option. The lane doesn't just come down randomly and just end up in random places. I mean, it could if people aren't paying attention. But you have the ability to control that. You have the ability to control how you want to position the wave. Okay? So in general, you know, when you're positioning, you want to deny as many resources to the enemy as you can. So you want to position safely as far forward as you possibly can and try to harass the enemy. Okay, so you want to use your auto attacks and abilities to punish the AD carry, particularly any time they try to hit a creep for gold. So you want to make them pay a price. Think of this concept. They pay for everything. Nothing is free. Okay, so they're going to pay with their HP. They're going to take a hit from you. They're going to pay with mana. Maybe you're forcing them to farm from a distance, like Ezreal's having to use Qs to farm. Maybe they have to use a cooldown. You know, maybe Varus has to use an arrow to try to farm, and after he uses that arrow, he's not going to have it to fight you anymore, so um, then you could fight him. Maybe you make them miss CS by harassing them. If you're pushing them into tower, if you're in a forward position, maybe you're getting damage on the tower so that eventually you get the first tower blood. Um, so all of these are ways that you could punish them. <clears throat> so I brought up a little resource here called Rift Kit just to kind of illustrate sort of how this would work. So let's say that, let me... Here's like a minion wave. Well, that's... That's a big menu wave. Let's go ahead and get rid of that. Okay. Let's put up a few uh, minions here. Alright, so here's a wave. Now, let's say that their support is just kind of, you know, and this would be indicative. Not everybody in silver and bronze, but this is like a lot of what you might see. Is their support just might be over here, you know, hanging out in this bush in a random spot. Your AD carry is going to be here, you know, because they're going to have, the enemy's going to have their creeps over here fighting as well. Now, it depends on which support you're playing, but you want to be playing like here-ish. Okay? So if the lane is up here, this is like the middle of the lane. Your AD carry is farming. Anytime their AD carry tries to come up, and hit one of these so they're trying to last hit this minion you need to hit them back you know auto attack them hit them with an ability just do something to you know make them pay a price for that now ideally you know you would want to be able to fade into this bush right so after you auto attack or use a single target ability on somebody like a lulu e the minions are going to aggro you and you want to go into the bush to drop that aggro because once they lose sight of you they'll quit attacking you Okay, but if the enemy support is in this bush, like over here, they're too far away to really harass your AD carry probably unless they come out of the bush. And you being right here allows you to harass without them being in range. They're not going to be in range to harass you. So it depends on where they're positioning, but your top priority needs to be stopping this person from farming. Like, so if you're Zyra, for example, you know, when they try to go up to farm, drop a Q plus a W on them and just get that range plant going. 
It's going to deal damage to them, and most of the time they're going to run away. And you want to do that right when they want to come up to get a last hit. So now they're going to have to choose. Do they want to get that last hit, or are they going to let you auto them one more time and eat a couple more plant shots? So they have to choose. Do they want to lose like half of their health, or do they want to lose that CS? Either way, you win. Like They get the CS and lose half of their health, or they run away and they miss the CS. So that's really what you want to do when you're laning. And, you know, the core principle to keep in mind is when an AD carry is going to last hit a minion, it's predictable because the minion's going to be low on health. So you can see it and you know where they're going to be for that moment. And so when they go for that auto, they have to stand still and they have to use an auto attack animation to attack that creep. You know that. So you know where they're going to be. And they're basically self-stunning themselves to do that. Because they can't hit you. They can't auto two people at once. So they can't hit you and the creeps. They have to choose. Are they going to hit you or are they going to hit the creep? And so therefore you get a free hit on them. Okay, so that's how that works. Like I said, when they go for that last hit here, then you hit them. So they hit the creep. You hit them. If they want to hit you, if you're walking up and they're like, they want to hit you instead, then they're going to miss this creep. So you always want to present them with a bad choice. You know, either way, they're they're losing something. They're either losing health, they're losing mana, they're losing gold off of the creep. Um, they're losing something. And you usually want to auto attack the AD carry because they ha they are predictable, right? They know, You know when they're going to go for the last hit. If you try to get their support, well, their support doesn't have to last hit, so you're not really sure where they're going to be most of the time, right? Um, like, they could just be moving around. They could be hanging out behind the AD carry. They could be in a forward position trying to harass you. You know, maybe they're over here trying to match you. Um, but they're a little bit harder to predict because they don't last hit. One way to be able to predict a support is if they're trying to clear a ward. So if you have this pinked right here and you cleared this out, you know, a good trick with Zyra is you could just hide right here, and then when they walk up and try to clear this pink ward, then you can go all in and kill them when they're trying to clear a ward. Okay? But people are vulnerable when they're auto-attacking, and that's just a good rule of thumb to understand in League of Legends, and you want to take advantage of that vulnerability and punish them. Okay, just be careful that when you're up pushing like that, that you understand how the lane works. So, for example, if you're a Sona, and, you know, they have their Leona and their Draven right here, and you're Sona Ezreal, you can, in theory, go up and harass, but you need to be very, very careful of this Leona. If this Leona engages on you, let's say you go up here to harass, and Leona ease onto you, um, you're going to have to flash. And you might die anyways, because Draven is going to auto-attack you and then stand aside and auto-attack you again, and you're probably dead if that happens. And Ezreal's just going to sit here like, well, I can't do anything because I'm Ezreal. Um, I mean, there are good Ezreals out there, but after these nerfs in the last couple of patches, he's really rough, especially in the early game right now. So, you know, and I, I get critiqued for this sometime on stream. People be like, why weren't you more aggressive in Wayne, man? You were just sitting there, like, chilling. Don't you know you're supposed to be aggressive? That's how you climb. It's like, yes, I do know that. I'm very aware of that. But you have to understand the matchup. You can't just be blindly aggressive every time. If you are in potentially a losing matchup, especially if you're a poke champion against an all-in champion, you need to be very careful. Or if you are something like Zyra against an Alistar, if Alistar is sitting right here... You know, it might be dangerous to go up to try to do something to the AD carry if Alistar's positioning aggressively, because he could combo you. So he's going to know if your cooldown goes down, if you use your E plant to try to tag him, or even if you just use your Q plant to try to tag him, he's going to see that cooldown, and he's going to say, okay, time to go, and he's going to engage all in on you. So you need to be very cautious about that and just cognizant. So don't just blindly be aggressive just because... You know, everybody says be aggressive to win, but you need to have measured aggression. You need to understand the matchup and just play it well. So speaking of that, you can't always be aggressive, okay? So that's good. That's the default. So your default should be how much can I get away with in terms of harassing the enemy AD carry to make them miss CS? Because every time they miss a creep, it's 20 gold, okay? So you're basically taxing them 20 gold. And that adds up eventually if... Your AD carry is up 20 CS on the enemy AD carry. That's the same thing as a kill. So it's like you just got a kill. 
And so all of these small things, like landing that extra auto attack, landing that extra skill, just making them take a hit every time they want to get a CS, that adds up. I mean, there's six CS, six auto attacks, right? If you hit an auto attack, even if they have armor, it's going to be like 40 damage. That's 240 damage per wave. That's 480 damage per minute if you do that on every single creep. How much health does somebody have at level one? Most 80 carries, if they get Doran's Blade, they're going to have like six or 700 with probably a potion. Probably like 650 with a potion. You know, we'll call it 800. Well, if they just took whatever that number was, I just said 480 damage from you. That's just auto attacking. That's not even using abilities. If they take 480 damage from you in the first minute. The second minute, they take another 480. Well, they're dead or they have to back. Now, that's assuming the enemy doesn't have any healing, which they will, and all that stuff. But you can see the point. That's just one auto per minion on them. If you don't do anything, they're going to be staying there full health the whole time, and they're never going to have to back. And if the enemy support is auto-attacking your um, AD carry like that, then your AD carry is going to have to back first. And usually a back, if you have to be the first person to back... You're going to miss a wave most of the time, which is six minions. So that is about 120 gold. So all of this adds up. It seems like it's not a big deal. Oh, who cares? You just land one auto attack or one ability. It adds up a lot because you can do that up to six times every 30 seconds. You know, and that's that's a lot of power over time. And that eventually snowballs. I mean, maybe you deny 10 CS in the lane. Your AD carry gets to get that BF sword. Their AD carry has to get a pick or something and just sit on, you know, just sit on gold. And then you're going to be a lot stronger. So then you can actually fight and all-in kill them at level 6 because you have a BF sword and they don't. Or because you complete your Infinity Edge and they haven't done it yet. <clears throat> okay, so that's ideal. But in the real world, what are some other positions? Okay, so this is kind of like the middle of the lane positioning. So that's kind of middle of the lane positioning. So there are some other positions as well. So the advantage of being in the middle of the lane is you can deny some CS, like I just talked about. You can harass them. Um, you're not going to be doing any damage to their tower, but they're not going to be doing any damage to your tower either. This is the best place for all in because towers are going to be out of the equation for the most part. And so if you're like a Leona, this is a great place for you because, you know, when that... Soraka tries to go up and harass your AD carry, you're like, okay, great, here we go, and you engage on her. Right? Whereas, if you were in a forward position, which we'll talk about now, let's say you're on red side, you're in a forward position, and they're sitting right here, um, then all of a sudden, you can't engage safely. Right? You can't engage on this... Uh, Soraka now because she's under tower. So now she gets to go up whenever your uh, AD carry is trying to farm. She gets to throw up and throw Qs and harass. And you can't get her or it's a lot harder to get her because you're under tower. Because this tower is going to block you. So that makes it a lot more difficult. Um, however, forward position, I'm going to say, I'm going to go ahead and just... I'm going to make blue the forward position here. Because I'm used to thinking about it in that way. So let's say that you have them backed in here. Say so you're the blue team. You have them backed in. And they've got the minions. You know, right around in here. Oops, not that. I'm getting used to this is my first time using Rift Kit, so. <clears throat> Okay, so you're in this forward position here. You know, support, AD carry. They're trying to farm, you're trying to farm. Okay, so the good thing about this position is you're eventually going to push them in a tower. So they're going to be, you know, somewhere like back over here. And there's going to be minions crashing in their tower. You're going to be up here. You get free hits on this tower. You get free harass on them if you're a ranged poke champion that they can't really retaliate on. So, you know... If you're Zyra, you can just spawn Q plants on them. If you're Sona, you can auto attack Q them. So you can just constantly harass them here, and it makes it very hard for them to engage on you because if they do, then these minions that are right here are going to start attacking them. 
You just have to be careful that you stay outside of tower range because if they engage on you at tower range, so if you are, you know, Sona and you're trying to go right here and harass AD carry and their Leona engages on you, you're probably going to die under tower. So you got to watch out for those tower ranges. But other than that, it's usually free harass on either them or the tower. So you can do a lot of damage to the tower or you can do a lot of damage to them. So this is a great position if you're playing a champion that's ranged, that has good harass. It's terrible if you are a melee all-in all champion most of the time. This is the worst position you could be in. Because if you're something like an Alistar, they just get to sit right here and farm, most likely. And you can't do anything. You can't engage on them. Um, and they're just going to get to farm. So they get the safety of that. And a lot of those all-in champions like Alistar, like Leona, um, they don't have good escapes. So one of the worst things about being in this position is that you're really vulnerable to the jungler. So, you know, jungler just rolls through here. Boom. You're probably going to die. Right? Um, now, you might say, but I can ward this. Yeah, but in 2018, you know, junglers are starting to get a bit smarter. Um, so they might do something, you know, like this. Very common. Or if they have some kind of jump, they could, like, jump over this wall and come get you. Or, I mean, if you don't have this secured right here, they could just pop over this wall and then come get you. Right? So, I mean, what are you going to do? Even if you have this warded, they blast plant over this wall and just start running at you, like Ramus just starts rolling at you right here. You know, what are you going to do about that? Um, it's going to be way too late. So that's kind of the problem is in the forward position, yes, you can apply a lot of free harass and you can do damage to the tower, but you're opening yourself up to the jungler. That's the biggest risk. So if you're going to be in a forward position, you need to make sure that the jungler is not going to be near you. So how can you make sure of that? Well... You can ward, so you can ward like right here and right here. Once you get your sight stone, um, you can pay attention to the rest of the map. So maybe you were in a middle position here, but you notice that the jungler's tops, and you're like, oh, okay, we can push, and then you push, and then you get into this position for like 30 or 40 seconds, and then it resets. After this minion wave crashes in the tower, oftentimes it'll reset to somewhere in the middle of the lane. Okay, so then you have the option of thinking... Okay, do I want to push again or do I want to stop? So maybe initially it was good to be in a forward position. Um, but now that you don't know where the jungler is for a little bit, maybe you have to back up. Um, so just having good wards and just paying attention to your mini-map and seeing where the jungler is is key if you're going to be forward. Now this could be a good thing if you draw the jungler down. If you have really good vision here, let's say you have like vision here and like vision here and you see them coming and you back up, you're kind of wasting their time. And so that's going to allow your top lane to continue to dominate or your mid lane to continue to dominate because their jungler is going to have to come down here. Just keep in mind that if your other lanes are losing really hard, so like let's say that, um, you know, your top laner's pushed in and your mid laner's pushed in. So let's say that every lane's losing, they're getting beaten in. Uh, then there's... It's extremely dangerous at that point to try to get into a forward position bottom because the jungler is definitely going to come for you because he can't gank top. He can't gank mid. Where's he going to go? He's going to go to bottom. Right? You're also opening yourself up potentially to the mid laner now rotating down here to come get you. So you need to be very aware if you go into the forward position that the jungler could come for you through all these different routes, and the mid laner could come for you, and the top laner. Um, I mean, let's say that they just somehow managed to sneak a ward in here. Top laner can teleport and then come over here as well. Um, because they are winning top and pushed in. Okay? So you, it's, you don't want to do a forward position if your other lanes are losing often, right? But if your other lanes are winning, so we take it on, you know, if we take the flip side of that, so let's say that your lane has pushing in everywhere. Now the jungler is overloaded. They don't know where to go because every lane's losing. And so if you have extra pressure down here, you're making it more difficult for the jungler, right? Because if they don't, if they come down here to stop you, mid's going to keep losing, top's going to keep losing. So if you have winning lanes in every lane, then this is actually pretty good as long as you don't get caught and die because it puts extra pressure on the jungler to do something. 
And these people are going to be crying the entire time, too. They're going to say, please come help me. The Zyra is just murdering me. What do I do? They're pushed into our tower 24-7. Like, it gets into the psyche of the enemy team if this stays like this for a while without the Jung Lord coming down to kill you. So just keep that in mind. Now, if you're in a forward position also, then your jungler, in theory, your jungler could come up here and dive them, depending on who you are. Or the mid, or your mid laner could come over here and also dive them. So a dive is possible. A dive is pretty complicated. I'm not going to cover that in this video. We'll talk about that in the rotations video. But just keep in mind that that's what happens when you have a forward position. You're creating a lot of pressure. You're becoming vulnerable to the enemy jungler. And you need to be very careful doing that unless your lanes are winning. Or unless you know where the jungler is. Okay. Um, okay, reset everything. Oops. There we go. <clears throat> okay, so we talked about middle. We talked about forward. Um, sometimes playing back is the best that you can do in a lane. I would say this is usually the worst place that you want to be in. But it depends on the mashup. So if we look at... this okay so let's say that you're getting beaten up you're playing back <clears throat> so now you're right here well the opposite applies now they're playing in a very forward position right oh another thing if you're playing in that forward position you you have the ability to roam right so now you can roam over and try to make a play mid lane you can get deep vision in their jungle because they're pushed into the tower, they can't do anything. You could roam over and get dragons. So if you push a tower in here, and then you disappear with the support, and they've just been pinned in this tower the whole time, they're not going to have any vision, so then they can just go do dragon. Or you can go do dragon, rather, if you have them pushed in. So all of this applies in the opposite to them. So now you're very safe, usually, in this position. So if you can freeze it, like, right here, this is, this is one of the best defensive positions. So that it's not in your tower, right? So you're not losing any damage to the towers. And now your jungler can come down and potentially gank. Your mid laner could come down and gank. So if your mid laner's winning, just like it was bad for you to push, if your lanes are losing, it's also bad for the enemy. It's bad for them, good for you, if the enemy pushes into you and your other lanes are winning. So even though you might be getting stomped down here, now... Um, if your lanes are winning, then your jungler can TP behind them down here. Your mid laner can run down here and kill them. Your jungler can take this really goofy, annoying path to get around wards and come down here and get you. Or to come down there and get them. So, you know, now you have the ability to do those things. Um, you know, so it's, it's iffy. If you're trying to bait them, you know, then you can assume this position and you know your team will probably be able to come down and make some plays on them this is good especially if they don't have escape so if they're playing something like a leona or a draven or whatever you can really punish them if they're pushed too far up like that so you'll see in most pro games a lot of times they try to keep the lane in the middle it depends but that's kind of the most neutral area it's like kind of safe but you have opportunities to make plays it just depends so I would say I would not try to default to this most of the time because what will end up happening is it'll get pushed into your tower and it's going to deny CS to your AD carry. They're just going to miss creeps under tower. Um, and you're also going to take damage on the tower. So I wouldn't try to do this. But sometimes you have to do this, right? If it's a really dangerous lane, especially against an all-in champion, this is how you defend yourself is you establish a defensive position. So if you're against something like, because I hear this all the time, well, how do I beat Blitzcrank? Blitzcrank's a little different, but like Leona, Alistar, <clears throat> those types of champions, those all-in, like hard engaged champions, can't do anything when you're positioned defensively like that until they get enough armor to dive you, until they're level 6 and get a couple of items, and they're not going to be able to do anything about that. So this is a great spot if you're something like a... Um, a Nami, for example, it's like Nami Ezreal against like Draven Leona. You're going to have to position here because if you're too far out in the lane, they can just engage and kill you whenever. Um, and it's really dangerous to push it. You're not going to be able to push into them because they're going to have too much threat and you're going to have to respect that and back up. So sometimes you just have to get in this position um, if they just have too much power for you. 
So just keep that in mind. You have the ability to choose this. You can pull the minions here, you can keep them in the middle, or you can take them top. And you might think, okay, well, what do I do? Like, my 80 carry doesn't know this. Like, I'm not hitting the creeps as the support, so how can I control this? Tell your 80 carry. Just say, hey, let's put the wave near the tower. Just say, put wave near tower. Defense. Or something like that. You know, just type quick words like that. Or, um, keep wave even. We fight. Or, push. You can push, right? So you can auto-attack the wave and force them and force your team to go into a forward position, right? Um, but it's a lot harder to get your AD carry not to push, to stop auto-attacking so that they can position it right here, okay? But just try to communicate it and do the best you can to help them out. And certain champions are going to push. They're going to position in certain ways. And they have to do that. So like Draven, for example, is always going to push. Because he has to constantly catch his spinning axes. Zyra is always going to push. Because her plants are inevitably going to hit some of the minion wave. Fiddlesticks has to push. Tristana usually has to push. Because when her... Um, when the minions die, they explode and do extra damage to other minions. So, those champions are a little bit at a disadvantage because they have to play a certain way most of the time. <laughs> it's a lot harder for them to assume a defensive position if they have to. But, you know, it's just something to, to keep in mind. How are we doing on time here? Oh, we're getting too long. We need to, we need to, move, we need to move on a bit faster. Um, so, yeah, just consider where you want to position the lane according to different matchups. And try to learn these matchups as much as you can over time and just position accordingly. If it's a losing matchup, position defensively. If it's a heavy winning matchup with poke, position forward. If it if you have an all-in champion and you're wanting to um, you know, fight them, or if you just want to stay in a neutral position if you're scared of the jungler, but you don't want to get pushed all the way in, then try to keep it in the middle. Okay. So in general, yeah, forward is max pressure, but you'll be a jungler magnet. Middle is moderate pressure, good all-in, and back is very safe from dangerous lane and jungler, but you're going to lose a lot of priority. You're not going to have good vision of the river. They can take the dragon anytime they want. They can rotate up and down that river. So if Blitzcrank pushes you in, he could go rotate middle, for example, and try to make a play. So getting pushed in is usually pretty dang bad. Okay. And just be careful choosing a losing lane, right? So look at, the, look at champ select and just think... Like, Janna is very strong, but is it best to pick Janna Ezreal if, um, you know, each of your other lanes is going to lose? So, if you have, like, a Diana middle against um, Orianna, or you have a, um, a Gangplank against a Scion top or something like that, you know, just try to learn these other matchups, too, a little bit, middle and top, and just think... Which champion's going to do better in the early game? And if you pick three lanes where the enemy, they're all going to do better in the early game, you can win those games, but it's really, really difficult. So, you know, in general, play the champion you're the, that you're the best with and you're the most comfortable with. But if there are multiple champions you can play that you are comfortable with, and, you know, one or two of your other lanes have picked losing lanes, you might need to pick a lane that's going to be a winning lane. That's up to you. But usually if every lane loses, it's very hard to win. Okay, Vision. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this. I have an entire video about Vision that you can check out. It's part of my macro video. Um, and I would suggest, you know, a lot of people watching this would probably love to watch the macro video. I cover a lot of things like Vision, Rotations, Objective Control. Um, it's five tips for better macro. So I've got it linked there and been one of the more popular um guides on the channel but yeah we talk about wind conditions shot calling controlling vision forcing favorable fights and communication so be sure to check that out um but in general you know understand where you want to be and then get vision there so if you want to do dragon pretty soon like let's say you just got this first tower you're telling the team hey let's go do dragon um then you want to ward like here and here and then maybe, like, depending on where they are, like, maybe here. Like, those three, and then drop a control ward, like, either right here. Like, right here is a pretty good place for a control ward if you're on blue side. 
because usually most people will come and they'll like they'll be too scared if you have them pushed in they'll be too scared to walk all the way over here toward this they'll just ward over this wall or they'll try to like ward over here go over this wall um and so just warding right here will catch anything on this wall especially right here supports the love to come over here and just like ward this area so you can check this and then it'll also clear out any wards in the middle now it won't see if they warded in like a weird angle here but that's rare from red side um so you know if if you are on if you're the red side doing dragon though then you always want to ward in the pit because the most common place where blue side's going to ward from is they're going to ward right over this wall right here okay so if you're on the red side you always ward in the pit but if you're on the blue side you can ward in the river because they're usually going to ward these places so that's what i'm saying is you need to get over here and just say okay let's go do dragon right now <laughs> after you get down the first tower and then just go like i'm really strong I just completed my Sorcerer Boots, and my Haunted Guys is Zyra. We just got First Tower. Our AD Carry has BF Sword. Or whatever, let's do this. And then just ward those spots. Okay. Or, you know, if you are... Let's say that you're top laner. I talk about all these scenarios in that video for about 10 minutes, the Vision video. So check that out, the macro. Let's say this top tower is down. Um... And your top lane is trying to push over here. Right? Well, you know, maybe this is your next objective is to... You're going to be split pushing now. Maybe there's no dragon. Maybe, um, you know, Baron's not going to be up for three or four more minutes. And this is the objective. Well, you need to ward because the next thing you're trying to do is execute a split push here. So good places to ward would be... Um, like right here. Right here and uh like either right here or right here so these would all be like reasonable places to ward and here's another place it's all right you never want to ward right here unless you have full control of the area so unless these tier two towers are down never ward right there because they're always going to sweep that they're almost always going to put a control ward there and they're always going to sweep it because that's the most popular place on the entire map so you can get around that by placing a ward uh here which, if they put a pink ward here, it's not going to see this. And then warding right here. Because if they have a pink ward here, in this bush, it's less likely to see this and this. So they, this is these are both excellent places to put wards. Okay. And then this is pretty good, too, because it gets vision of this entire hallway and over here. And, you know, they will sweep this some, um, but it's less likely than this place. So by doing that, you're moving your vision here. So even if you had all of your vision around Baron... A set or around dragon a second ago to get dragon and now you're switching into split push mode top you need to move your wards from over here to over here so that this person can safely split push so they know um if the enemy is going to come over and mess with them right so they can you know bully them in a tower and push them up okay so just make sure that you're warding around whatever your next objective is and then finally, communication. I'm not going to talk about it a ton in this video because I do talk about it a lot in the macro videos. Once again, so check out the macro video. But um, you need to be a leader. Like, that's the key thing here is you need to direct your team in order to climb. You can't be an innocent bystander, right? There's no such thing. So if you see people doing dumb stuff and you let that happen without telling them politely, you know, like, hey, let's not, like, don't fight, it's 4v5. Or don't do bear and their junglers up. Or, um... Let's go get this tower after we get these two kills. Let's go get dragon after we get these kills. Like, you need to be directing people. You can't just say, like, oh, you know, this guy, uh, we just kept chasing kills and nobody ever got dragon. And, um, you know, we just lost because everybody's bad. You know, that kind of stuff. Like, you have to try to direct them. Now, not everyone's going to listen. Um... And, you know, you're probably going to make some bad calls while you're, you know, trying to learn this stuff. But it's important that you're at least trying to take ownership of the um, of the game, right? That you're trying to be a leader, that you're trying to influence the outcome. Because if you don't, if you're just playing like everyone else in the whatever division you're in, you're going to stay in that division. You know, like you have to play better than everyone on your team in order to climb. Like if you think that you're not really playing that much better than people on your team, then... 
you need to change something because you're not going to climb. Okay? So the trick is you have to make them better. I talked about this in my um, luck video. <coughs> Was check that out as well. I have a ton of I have a ton of good content on the channel, I think. But I did a luck video probably a couple of weeks ago at this point, um, a video on league luck, and I talk about that a lot. Where, you know, people think that something is just bad luck or there's nothing they can do. When in fact, usually there is. It's just not immediately obvious, and that usually has to do with communication. Like you can tell people, hey, we need this type of item, or hey, can you itemize defensively, or hey, let's rotate over here hey, let's do that, or hey, let's not fight because TP's not up, or let's not do Baron because the jungler just used his smite on the scuttle. So you need to spot all of these things and communicate it. So you need to ping everything. This is the best thing that you can do is just ping ally summoner CDs. So if your top lane doesn't have teleport and your team is about to fight at Dragon, tell them, do not fight, we don't have teleport. Okay. Or if your ally is missing a flash. You know, say, don't fight. You know, we're missing this key cooldown. You know, whatever. This person doesn't have flash. Okay? Like, maybe your hard engaged champion that needs a flash. Maybe your Annie, for example, doesn't have flash. And it's like 20 more seconds. Say, don't fight Annie's flash 20 seconds. Okay? Um... Be sure to ping your important cooldowns. Ping your ultimate. Say, hey, I'm Zyra. I've got 15 seconds on this ultimate. Don't fight. 15 seconds. Wait. Or exhaust. Maybe you're going up against a Zed, and he's really fed, and you need that exhaust. Say, don't fight. My exhaust has 30 seconds. Then we can fight. Okay? Um, or redemption. You know, ping your items, too. If they're active items, say, hey, I've got 10 seconds on redemption. Wait, and then we can fight. If there are missing enemies, ping it. So don't just ping your lane. Obviously, you want to ping your lane if there are missing things on the map. So, you know, if Alistar goes missing, you have no idea where he is, ping it. Right? Just ping the river here. Oh, that's that's awful. Uh, I'm not even sure what that is. Yeah, just ping the river. Say ping, ping. I don't know where he is. Okay, he's missing. So ping... And ping like a series of things too. Don't just ping one question mark. Ping here, here, and here. So they know, okay, he's missing for bot lane and he's probably in the river. Right? And don't just ping that, like ping his portrait too. So question mark, question mark, question mark. Ping Alistar's portrait like three times so they know what you're talking about, okay? So Alistar's missing, okay? Or, and don't just do it for your lane, do it for other lanes. Okay, so... um Let's say that the enemy has a TF, middle lane, Twisted Fate, middle lane. Okay, your ally gets pushed in here. You're on blue side. Your ally gets pushed in, and then TF just, like, disappears. You have no idea where he went. Okay? So, is should the mid laner ping missing? Sure, they should. But a lot of times they won't. So, if you know it, why would you not ping it? You know, so you need to take ownership. Once again, it's not your lane, but it's your game. You're the one calling the shots here. You're the one making sure that you're going to win more games than you lose. So you need to take ownership of that. Okay? So just ping missing. Same deal as Alistar. Same as your lane. Ping missing here. Um, if you don't know exactly where he went, just ping missing a couple of times. And then just, you know, ping him. Ping the TF like three times. Not where he is, but like his name, his portrait. If you don't know where he went. If you do know where he went, if you saw him leave and go to the top side here, if you saw him push this wave and then like disappear into the river here, you know, ping this, ping it like three times, and then come up here to top lane and ping back. You know? Ping him back and then just, you know, type TF incoming and like all all caps or something like that. Just let people know what's going on. So ping when people are missing. If you see the jungler, like maybe there's a ward up here. Um, so maybe their jungler like is over here doing raptors or something. So maybe their jungler is over here doing raptors and your mid lane's pushed in right here or something like that. And maybe you see that jungler like coming around this way. And let's say that you, your team has a ward, like, right here. 
I can't do like an I or something on that. You know, it's it's not gonna work. <laughs> Maybe you got like an I or something here. Uh, ping that. Let them know. Like, should your jungler notice that? Sure, but maybe they don't. Um, so ping this. Ping question mark. Same deal. Ping question marks on top of them. And then ping uh, back. Back ping on mid lane. And then ping the jungler's portrait a lot. So yeah. Just anything that you see that's good information. Okay, the jungler's here. Okay, mid lane's missing. Bot lane's missing. Um, ping dragon timer. You know, dragon's going to be up in 30 seconds. Ping it like three times and ping like on my way. So ping dragon three times, you know, just ping the crap out of dragon. And then just ping like I'm on my way. And type help me set up. You know, so just let them know. Um, if, you're, if you're coming, if you're on a way to an area, don't just walk somewhere. Let people know where you're going. Give them that info. You know, maybe, um, maybe you're going mid lane for a gank, right? So maybe you just got your uh, just got your mobility boots, your Alistar, right? And they have your ally pushed in here, uh, ping on the way, just ping like I'm coming, I'm coming, you know, just ping right here, ping on top of them, and then rotate around. You could even ping their portrait, ping the Twisted Fate's portrait. Just type, like, on my way. That gives the mid laner a heads up. They know you're going to be there in, like, 15 seconds. So then they know, okay, you know, if I'm Rise, I'm not going to waste my W to farm under tower now because I know that the Alistar is going to be here, so I'm going to save my crowd control for this um, Alistar. Or maybe they know something you don't. Maybe uh, they caught a glimpse of the jungler, for example. Right? So maybe they saw the jungler, and they know the jungler's sitting right here, even though it's not warded. Maybe they saw him just out of a sliver of their screen right here, and you just, you didn't notice it, but they did. Maybe they just say, you know, don't do it. Don't do it. They're junglers here, right? So when you communicate, if they know more information or if they think it's a bad idea, don't do it. So maybe you're coming in here. Maybe, um, I don't know, maybe you're... Uh, you're going into gank for the Malzahar, and you're thinking, okay, he's got ultimate. I'm coming in with Alistar. We're gonna, we're gonna get it. And then maybe he pings his ultimate and says, no, no, I don't have it. It's gonna be another thirty seconds. And you're like, oh crap, I forgot to look at that. And they look, you look down, and you're like, oh, it is. It's gonna be thirty seconds before his ultimate. Okay, well, I'm not gonna waste my time then. I'm just gonna go back bottom. Okay. Or maybe you're thinking, I'm gonna come in this way, and then maybe he pings. You know, okay, but this is warded. So then you can decide, okay, well, maybe I just rotate around and like try to go this way, or maybe I just give up on it. Maybe if he tells me all of this is warded, then I just say, okay, it's a waste of time. I'm just going back bottom. So when you communicate stuff like that, your team might communicate back to you and give you more valuable information. So it's not just a one-way street. It's not just that you're telling them like what to do and where you're going to be and all that stuff. You're giving them, you're creating an atmosphere of communication where they will also give you information sometimes. Okay, they'll say, don't do it, you know, I can't fight, I'm going to lose. Uh, maybe you forgot to look at the items, and they ping, you know, Fizz has Death Cap and Lich Bane. I only have Needlessly Large Rod. I'm losing really badly, don't come gank. Okay, so just ping everything as much as you can. Just any information that you have, let the team know, Okay. And then try never to fight a 4v5 as much as you can, general rule of thumb. And just don't fight if the um, if your ally is split pushing without teleport because that is a 4v5. Okay, there's just a couple of quick tips. So I talk about all that stuff and more in my macro video, so be sure to check that out. I just wanted to cover a couple of the basics here of the laning fundamentals. And I wanted this video to be faster, but it's not. <laughs> it's an hour and 20. So we'll go ahead and wrap this up here. So thanks again to Steve. Really appreciate it. The major thing to keep in mind, once again, is all of these are resources, these five things. Items, cooldowns, positioning, vision, communication. You need to do everything that you can to use these resources better than the enemy, and that's how you climb. If you're buying more efficient items, if you're thinking more critically about your items, if you're paying attention to your items, who's strong, who's not, based on their items... That helps you win. If you play around the cooldowns, when you have your big cooldowns, when you have your ult, when they don't have their ults, if you're choosing favorable fights based on cooldowns, if Blitz misses his hook, and so you go all on his Zyra, 
you're going to win a lot more games because you're going to be using your cooldowns better than them. You think about positioning. How should I play this lane? Are we going to win? Are we going to lose? Um, you know, am I scared of the jungler? Are my other lanes winning or losing? All those things that we talked about, if you just think carefully about your positioning in the lane, um, that will help you win more games, right? And then finally, just vision and communication, just getting information and distributing that information to your team so that you guys can make the best possible choices will help you win um, as well. So that's going to be it. Thanks again. Have a good day, and I'll see you next time.